Good afternoon and welcome to the March 10, 2022 special meeting of the Board of Library Trustees. Call the meeting to order and ask Francesca to describe for the public how they can participate in this afternoon's meeting. You're muted, uh, Francesca. Who do you Thank think you. you are me? <laughs> <laughs> So there are two ways to virtually participate in meetings. You may join on Zoom using your computer or smartphone, and you may call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom, use the link or phone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, enter meeting ID 161-352-8864, followed by the pound sign, if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment using Zoom, we'll ask that you raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand button in the Zoom toolbar. If you dialed in by phone, you raise your hand by dialing star nine and unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. Attendees will be muted until it is your turn to speak. Public speakers will be called on the order of their hands raised. We ask that you stay within the time limit established for today's meeting that will be shown using a countdown timer on the screen. If you are connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey with an approximate 10 second delay and on Comcast channel 25 with up to a 90 second delay. If you plan to make a public comment, join the meeting using Zoom or by telephone and ensure you join in time to accommodate the delay. As always, we look forward to receiving your public comment. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, next item on our agenda is the roll call. Could you uh, call the roll, please, Francesca? Yes. Felgu? Yes. Here. Joshi? Joshi? Present. Present. Morel? Present. Petty? You're, you're muted, Bob. I did raise my finger here. I, but yeah, my <laughs> understanding is we actually need a verbal verbal recording for official purposes. Yeah, sure. And Thompson. I'm present as well. Uh, thank you very much. And the next item on our agenda normally would be consent items. However, uh, for this special meeting, we don't have any consent items. So I'll skip past that part of the agenda to public comments. Uh, Francesca, could you see if any member of the public wishes to speak on any item that's not on our agenda for today's meeting? Yes. To make a public comment, please raise your Zoom hand or dial star nine. Chair Thompson, there are no public comments. Thank you, Francesca. Then the next section of our uh, agenda is the public appearance uh, items. Uh, and today we have two items, uh, the uh, final report of the ad hoc survey committee and the uh, proposed uh, general fund and trust fund budgets for next uh, fiscal year. And they may overlap a little bit, um, uh, but I think we can talk about them separately. And if we need to, we can kind of combine them. But I think for now, let's try to deal with them separately. Um, so the first item, item number one on our public appearance uh, agenda is the final report of the ad hoc survey committee. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, uh, both Vice Chair Felgeth and Trustee Petty for uh, working on this uh, survey and providing this report. And uh, you were able to get this survey done in a fairly short period of time. And I appreciate uh, your expediting that so we'd have some results that we could consider when we do talk about the budget. So with that, uh, either Inga or Jennifer or Bob, uh, would somebody like to make an overview of your report? So I'll jump in and then just give a brief overview and then allow the committee members to make their comments. So uh, just as a reminder, the, the survey opened December 28th and closed on February 28th. And, um, the survey was intended to uh, learn how the public were responding to our opening procedures so far, and then advise us on um, things that we haven't yet restored, services that we haven't yet restored. And then it also conveniently was timed so that it would give us feedback for um, looking at the budget as well. So um, the survey committee met several times, the library board received a full copy of all the comments 
from uh, survey respondents. There were 131 um, people who participated. And um, we note that there were no participants under the age of 20, um, but initially we were a little concerned that we were getting mostly people 66 and older participating, but those numbers went up by the close of the survey. And um, uh, it's interesting that 70% of the folks commented during the first two weeks that the survey had opened. And just to keep in mind, that was during the height of the Omicron variant. So that might have influenced some of the responses. And um, let's see, we had a fair number, the bulk of the respondents were from a Monterey zip code. And then uh, the next largest group, which was only 10%, was um, from Seaside and then uh, the next largest group, 6% from Pacific Grove. And um, then the, the committee met a couple of times, first to look at the preliminary data and then um, to look at the final data and um, had a, a good healthy discussion and came up with several recommendations. And those recommendations are listed in the report. So now I'll turn it over to the committee members. Okay, good. Jennifer, would you like to begin? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, you can see the recommendations here. Um, one topic that just kept coming up over and over and over again was the public wants more public service hours, which of course, right now due to lack of staffing, we're unable to provide. But if this new budget augmentation allows us to add staff, um, the priorities were folks really wanted a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we had put in here maybe open one to six. I don't know, Bob and I talked a little bit that it might make more sense to make it one to five and have like a four hour increment. But I think a lot of that's gonna depend on do we have staff and how does that work with scheduling? Because when you start scheduling half days, it really wreaks havoc with your schedule. So that was a consideration. Folks also would like an evening hour because people who work uh, found that it was just too difficult to get off work and get to the library by six o'clock, which is the current closing time. Uh, however, after eight o'clock, it's pretty much like a graveyard in there. So uh, the committee's recommending uh, perhaps expanding one night a week, uh, open 10 to eight. Um, so that we'd add two more service hours. Um, oh, and I should say on the Sundays, we discussed maybe as a baby step starting out and being open one Sunday a month, that would help a little bit with the staffing issues. And if you promote it as first Sunday, it makes it easy for the public to remember, and it does pro provide an option. And then based on that, we can kind of gauge where we go in the future. Um, the other thing people were interested in is more bookmobile stops. Uh, and again, this is going to be contingent upon whether or not we can hire uh, and staff the bookmobile with a full-time bookmobile person uh, in order of priority from the survey results, people really wanted uh, the bookmobile to be able to go to city preschools. And one of the other uh, stops that got a lot of uh, votes was the Casanova Oak Knoll Center. Um, I live in that neighborhood and my observation is even if the center itself isn't open, that's where the school bus picks up and drops off kids. So during the school year at four o'clock, there's parents, there's kids, there's little brothers and sisters. And um, there's so much going on in this community that if we did something over there in an afternoon, it would get quite a bit of use. Uh, on the subject of meeting rooms, uh, currently, it, based on survey results, there wasn't a real big demand, but I think part of that may be, as, as Inga pointed out, uh, the survey was conducted when Omicron was really cresting in the area. Um, so the committee recommended that um, if more staff positions are added 
um, that we could resume reservations for outside groups starting in July, but that's contingent on staff positions. It takes people to be able to book, process paperwork, keep an eye on what's going on. And you, know, you can't do it with the existing level of staffing. Uh, and uh, as far as the community room, we thought a baby step would be uh, using it for staff-led programs before the new fiscal year if needed. Um, reopening the quiet study room, which is a topic of interest, uh, is also tied to more staff. Right now, with our current level of staffing, it'd be really difficult to monitor, which means it could be a real problem area. Uh, and again, uh, the solarium, uh, perhaps we could reopen that with the new fiscal year when re room reservations would resume. Uh, sidewalk service, currently usage is low, but uh, we recommend continuing it for now because of ongoing COVID-19 concerns. We don't know what's going to happen, and it would be terrible to totally nuke that service out um, and then find out that we're having a new variant, a new surge, and it's needed again. Um, so that, that's our recommendation. Uh, we also need more publicity for the patron app and Flipsters. Uh, one thing we considered was maybe as part of a program offering some virtual training or tacking it on to other programs where you could maybe reserve 15 minutes at the end and do like a quick training session on how to use this. We've got great things, but if people don't know they exist and they don't know how to use it, it's the same as not having them. Uh, we <clears throat> wanted to also make more ser those services pro more prominent on the website. Uh, and definitely we wanna retain virtual programs for adults. They're very popular, even if in-person programs resume. Uh, the one thing that came through the surveys, through it all, our customers are so incredibly grateful and loyal to library staff. They constantly express their satisfaction with library services and their appreciation for our staff. So staff is to be commended on that. Um, and then finally, our committee will end its work with this report, but we strongly recommend uh, forming a similar committee in the future. So if we do enact some of these things, that we can develop an assessment model where we can come back and gauge how effective uh, what we're doing is and tweak if necessary. Um, so that's all I've got. Bob, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, not so much add because everything you said, um, of course, we've discussed and agree on. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say that uh, even though the words aren't in this printed report, everything Jennifer said is, um, I don't want to say overshadowed, but it, it, it is uh, underneath <clears throat> the desire of our respondents and I think ourselves and the staff to continue, if not increasing our acquisition of materials mm -hmm. yes. for circulation. Because as I said in our last regular Bolt meeting, uh, that has come up in every single survey we've ever mm -hmm. done or G4 or anybody else, that they want to have an update, expanding current uh, collection of materials. And so mm -hmm. that that's almost a given. So maybe that's why it's not listed here. Um, and the, the idea of, uh, expanding to a Sunday and having it have sort of its own special name, first Sunday at Monterey, mm -hmm. Library, Monterey Public Library, just sounded like a way to publicize it because at first the concern we thought of was, well, how will they know which Sunday it is? Yeah, well, yeah, if we yeah. give it a special name, that would help that. And um, another use for um, expanding to 8 p.m. on Wednesdays and Wednesdays only is not just to uh, satisfy the needs of people that are working and can't get to the library by six, but that means that could be a night where the library is already open and we could use it for library programs, guest speakers and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, storytellers and things like that that we've done before, but it would be in this time slot that's already committed to being open and uh, it would make, uh, uh, starting to do some of those programs 
maybe a, a little bit easier. Um, other than that, uh, everything Jennifer said is uh, right on and uh, we agree with uh, completely. So I'll just sort of add those nuances and uh, <laughs> suggest that whatever we do with regard to numbers and dollars and budgets and everything, that these recommendations be, uh, and that of course includes the staff to enact these different things, um, be our priorities when we present our requests and everything to whether it's the city manager or the city council or the city finance department or whoever it is. Okay, very good. Well, thank thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Inga, Jennifer, and Bob for a thorough uh, uh, and yet succinct uh, summary of the recommendations. Um, shall we start with any uh, questions before asking if there's any public input? Marsha. I just had a question. This was wonderful and and uh, clearly backed up by all the data. So uh, that's 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 good to know. Um, some of these, for example, the first Sundays and the Wednesdays, are they will they require additional budget? This is kind of a budget question too. Um, do they require additional budget, or is that juggling people's hours around who are already here? Um, at, at, I, I guess what I mean is, I know that we're asking for additional monies, but in your budget request, can you accommodate this or does more have to be added? I guess that's what I meant. Right. The, the thinking is that we could accommodate some very minimal expansion of hours if the positions we're requesting mm -hmm. are funded. Yeah. And the same with the bookmobile. If we have the full time person, we can add the, those other stops. Yeah. That would, Right. And I think, you know, this is the recommendation with what information we have now, and we'll need to kind of revisit it uh, when we see what positions are going to be funded, mm -hmm. and then probably do a check-in, you know, maybe even a follow-up survey with the Casanova Oak Knoll residents versus Hilltop or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we can always check in and kind of fine-tune it. Um, also with the hours, um, actually, Hans, I had a meeting with the city manager and assistant city manager, and they both thought, well, if you had the adequate staff, maybe you want to be open every whatever additional day it's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, Sunday afternoon, so that you don't have people getting mm -hmm. confused. But of course, that will depend on, um, and I'm glad Kim is sitting in on this, she's our schedule, our master scheduler and she'll have to pencil it out and look and see you know mm -hmm. one one day a month would be doable but would it be doable to do all of them so we'll have to see and okay. other questions i have a couple well, bob you have a question well i just wanted to point out something in case it uh, generates <laughs> questions amongst the rest of the board uh, Further down in our agenda in the uh, beginning text part of the uh, second item, uh, it makes reference to the ad hoc uh, policy review committee recommending revisiting the uh, fines through an equity lens. And the whole idea of, and preceding that is, um, um, uh, Inga wrote that the, um, you know, a lot of libraries, in fact, most libraries are not. Uh, levying fines on late books. And we're sitting here, maybe the only one, and it's not really generating a ton of money, but um, <clears throat> um, so something that we need to talk about, not just look sort of at uh, what's staring us in the face, but that would be a consideration. And if it, my personal opinion, if I'll throw it in right now, and is that anything that could make <clears throat> The city dependent on the library generating revenue should be minimized. Yeah. yeah. And that would include finding people for late books. But I just wanted to add that into the mix in case there were other things that, or other mm -hmm. comments that uh, people wanted to make. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions about the uh, survey report, uh, but before I ask mine, did uh, Marsha or uh, Harish have any additional questions? No. Mm -hmm. well, Okay. Let's see a quick one. Go ahead. Bob mentioned about suspending the fines. Uh, do the fines go to the city or do they go into the library directly? Is it the city that's benefiting from it? 
Well, so the city, the, the funds go directly to the city. They aren't set aside in a special account for the library. Okay. But whenever that concern is raised, then we're reminded that 96.4% um, typically of our budget is funded from the general fund. So whether it's revenue generated by sales tax or revenue generated by library fines or revenue generated by the uh, visitors who stay in hotels, um, you know, a portion of that money is set aside for the library. So if we found some kind of, and you were on this committee, wonderful way to raise a couple of million dollars a year, not with library fines, but some other thing, um, then, you know, a portion of that would then help improve library service. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I, I did have two questions. Um, one of them related to the question of hours. Uh, you know, if we if we do have um, adequate staff that we can look at uh, opening more hours, um, kind of two pieces of that. One, you know, if we did open, say, for example, Wednesday, as was suggested, uh, uh, till eight in the evening, I mean, it, it would be nice to be open from 10 to eight, but another alternative, it seems to me, would be from 12 to eight. So you'd still be a eight hour shift. So it, it, in my mind, you know, we probably should keep an open mind about that kind of thing, um, you know, pending finding out what the, uh, what the staffing approved eventually by the city council is. Um, but to me, even if we did just shift one day from 12 to eight compared to the current 10 to six, I think that would still be a step in the right direction, but obviously 10 to 10 to eight would be even better. Um, the, the other thing um, was on Sundays, um, it, it did appear from the survey data that in terms of just the comments that people made, that there seemed to be more uh, people supporting opening on Sundays than on Mondays. So I can see why the committee suggested Sundays. But on the other hand, if we go back to the, Kind of the profile of who filled out the survey i mean we had nobody below 20 and you know what i've heard anecdotally is that there are a lot of students that would like to be using the library on a monday afternoon but none of them were none of them apparently completed the survey and so i don't know if we really had a, a more representative group filling it out if sundays would still be preferred over mondays and again there was no direct question on that it was just kind of interpreting the the open-ended comment responses but I, I in my mind i just have to question whether sundays is really a higher priority than mondays give especially considering school children um and and i was curious in that regard uh inga if you know prior to the pandemic do you know on, on a per hour basis did we have more people uh coming to the library on sundays or mondays do you happen to know i don't happen to know that but that's an excellent thing to take a look at I know mm -hmm. that uh, both Kim and I can attest that it's kind of heartbreaking since we are in the building on Mondays to see the number of kids that come yeah. running up to the doors and then they can't get in. So then they, they pile up, you know, on uh, mm -hmm. the sidewalk out in front and the benches and so forth because they're, they're waiting for their um, parents to pick them up. And so they're all clustered around our building. <clears throat> Just not able to get inside, um, and but I, I don't have those numbers. Uh, yeah, Bob, Bob. I think Bob has come at too. Um, Inga, when when you're talking about that and you're saying you see all the kids out there Monday afternoon, they can't get in. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about dozens or hundreds or thousands? How big of a number do you think? <laughs> Just guess. I know you haven't seen right. it. Right. Well, on a when we are open, it's somewhere well, between sixty and eighty kids that come through. Okay. The so doors. what? What? Let's say it's the same number on Monday. It uh -huh. might be more, might be fewer, but let's just say it's sixty people, just to pick a number that might fit. Yeah. There could be sixty people who would come to the library on Sundays, except they know ahead of time that it's closed, <laughs> and they stay home, so they don't drive up to the library and congregate outside the mm -hmm. front door and go, oh crap, the library's closed. They're at home saying the same thing and we don't see them out there. So mm -hmm. I don't think we can just say because kids walk down the hill from school and go, oh geez, the library door is closed, that it's necessarily a day when we would get a lot more. And I'm you know, concerned about accommodating the daytime needs 
of the adults who, um, you know, just as there are some that want to come in the evening because they work till six and they can't make it. And that's why we're talking about a Wednesday night. There are plenty of people that don't, especially seniors that don't drive out, don't go out at night and they would want a Sunday afternoon. So, I mean, I guess with, with without an unlimited budget, we're not gonna be able to please everybody with everything we do. And hey, I'd please. like to please as many people, at least a little bit as possible. Yeah, it's certainly worth um, further discussion when we get to the point of, of having the, I won't say luxury because it should be basic, but you know, having the ability to, to restore uh, hours and prioritize them. Yeah. Um, I know that in the past when we had a teen librarian, that person worked Mondays through Fridays because that's when the teens were around. The teens that are using the library typically don't live here. I would say a higher percentage don't live here, but come here to go to school. And so on the weekends, you have fewer teens around. So it, it doesn't make sense to have a teen librarian working on a Sunday, for instance, because um, they would just be doing other things. They wouldn't be uh, serving their group. So it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to figure out. Ideally, we would <clears throat> restore hours, you know, seven days a week the way we were before, but that's going to require some more staffing changes likely before we get to that point. Um, and I will comment on um, Jim's suggestion of opening the library um, noon to eight as opposed to 10 to eight. And the committee did talk about that. And one of the concerns uh, that was expressed is that when we have had different times of day that were open on different days of the week, then people can get frustrated and just say, you know, I don't know when you're open anymore. I come in the morning, you're closed. I come in the evening, you're closed. Um, so the, the beauty of our current schedule is that every day that we're open, we're open the same hours. So the thinking was, if we have enough staff just to stay open two hours later, but not shave that off in the morning, if we have the capacity, then we wouldn't confuse the people that, you know, say, oh gosh, now you're not open in the mornings anymore. I came on Wednesday and you were closed. Good point, thank you. Um, moving on to my other question that had to do with the uh, sidewalk service. <clears throat> and, um, and I think we all probably agree that while we still have some COVID concerns, it probably makes sense to keep that service going. Um, at least I, I tend to agree with the committee's recommendation in that regard. But, I, but I, since it, it is a fairly low level of activity, I, th I think I read somewhere that it's uh, often around one person per, per day that uses the service kind of on an average. Um, I'm wondering if it really, uh, it, it, in terms of looking at staffing productivity, if it might be reasonable to reduce it to one hour a day instead of two hours a day. Um, and I wondered if you had any, uh, either Inger or the committee had any thoughts about if it is only one person a day on the average, whether or not, whether one, maybe for example, 11 a.m. to noon instead of 10 a.m. to noon, since I think the second hour gets more business than the first hour is worth considering. I, I ran that past uh, the supervisors, uh, David and Kim, and what they said is, or David especially, if you reduce the hours, you are inconveniencing the people who are trying to use it. And the sooner you'll have not enough users and then you'll decide to stop the service was his thought that for the convenience of the public, we should keep it running two hours a day if at all possible. Okay, Marsha. Uh, a further question on that. It's, it seems to me that um, the way you have it set up is it's a staff member just is doing something else. And when the doorbell rings, they just get up from the table. So there's not somebody dedicated sitting there for two hours doing this, right? They're just, they're doing something else. So once an hour, they have to get up for 10 minutes and then they go on about their business. So if nobody uses it, uh, for a couple of days, it, it's okay because they have they're doing something else, right? Or 
Is that the well, and, and the, the thing is, is that some staff whose workstations are very close to the doorbell mm -hmm. can um, get their work done. Uh, the work that involves staying put at a computer. Mm -hmm. um, but when we don't have staff available who are very close to the doorbell, then we have to take a person from another work area and station them there and and they might need a cart of things to go with them and so forth so it can get a little difficult and when we have trouble staffing the main desk i think that's when we're thinking oh you know shoot we have to have a person dedicated at a computer back there and and we're we're struggling to cover the place where most people come in to ask questions Okay, if there are no other questions uh, at this point, uh, Francesca, could you see if there's any public input on uh, item number one, I believe this is. Yes. yes, item one. Yes, we do encourage members of the public to join our meeting via Zoom. You will be connected live in real time to the meeting. To join by telephone, dial toll free 833-568-8864, enter meeting ID 161-352, 8864 followed by the pound sign to make a public comment raise your zoom hand or if you are connected by phone dial star nine chair thompson there are no public comments okay thank you then uh, further discussion on the um, survey committee report mm -hmm. I, I i guess i would th th there are some some meaty recommendations here um, and they're not actually part of the formal recommendation for board action. So I, I was kind of interpreting this as kind of uh, items to be basically to be referred to staff to come back at the appropriate time, de depending on what budget is approved in terms of a, kind of how to implement some of these issues. Is that is that a fair summary of where the committee is coming from? I'm seeing uh, nodding of heads, so I'll, I'll assume that's. Yeah. I'll assume that's the case. Um, then I, I, I would suggest that um, after the the budget is better better determined, um, that particularly the question of the hours, you know, the expanded hours that were open that do come back to the board. I, you know, I've I've heard some issues on both sides of the Sunday versus Monday question, um, but um, one of the things that to me would be helpful would be some data on pre-pandemic, what was the hourly um, customer count or circulation, you know, some, some sort of metric that gives us a little better sense of how heavily it was used uh, per hour open on Sunday versus Monday, especially Monday afternoons. Uh, but, you know, wh whatever, however it's best accumulated, I think that data would be helpful in, in trying to make some of those judgments, at least it would be to me. Um, and um, the others, I think, um, you know, in my mind, are basically referrals to staff to come back to the commit to the board at the appropriate time. You know, those that require board action to uh, implement some of them, I think, can be pretty much implemented, you know, without further board action, probably. Um, and I particularly also wanted to comment that I strongly agree with the number seven that the customers report a high level of satisfaction with and appreciation for staff that definitely came through in the responses to the survey. I mean, I mean, to, I thought an amazing degree. Um, I was very touched by some of the comments and I think we probably all were. So I wanted to thank the committee for all their work and particularly for highlighting that um, appreciation to staff as part of it. And I also would agree with the idea that a similar committee uh, uh, be established in the future. I would assume that would be probably after uh, the new budget is adopted and some things have been implemented. So we could at that point do a survey of, of, of the changes in the staffing model and the service model that were, were implemented as part of next year's budget. Um, so I'm thinking that would be up to the next chair of the board to uh, appoint such a committee. Uh, but I, I certainly support that. Um, any other comments anybody wanted to make about the uh, uh, the survey committee report? Bob? I just wanted to throw out one option. And it's, again, like uh, Jim said, uh, a lot of these things are going to be discussed uh, more in, in, in terms of in, in implementing them after we know what budget we end up having to work with. <clears throat> 
And with regard to the additional data that Jim was just uh, requesting, I think that would be um, you know, very helpful. And if we're concerned about having uh, two hours a day for sidewalk service um, be, being uh, detrimental to the staff members' work or costing more money or something like that, um, I don't know about you, but if I put a book on reserve and I get the email that says, Bob, it's on the shelf ready for you to pick up, I'm not necessarily running down the hill and getting the book that very same day. It'll sit there for maybe two or three days until it's convenient for me to go in and take it off the shelf on my way to the grocery store or something, okay? So I'm not sure, and, and, and especially if we don't levy fines, but with a three-week loan period on most uh, items, people can return or get books. Um, I mean, it's not such a pressing issue. So I guess what I'm leading up to is saying maybe the sidewalk service isn't every single day. And maybe we could think about uh, only having it, you know, part of the days instead of every single day, just as a way of uh, reducing any of the uh, downsides that we've been talking about. And I don't mean to have a big discussion or figure out now because it'll depend on other things, but that would be an option that I think, given that we won't be turning away dozens and dozens of people every day, as uh, I think it was Jim pointed out, the number of people using sidewalk service on, per day is um, maybe one dozen at most. And so if we spread that out over fewer days, it might make it more uh, time efficient. Yep, good point. Okay, any other further, any further discussion on the uh, survey committee report? If not, I again want to thank uh, uh, Jennifer and Bob for their work on that, as well as Inga and the support of the uh, committee. Uh, appreciate that very much. I think it's been quite helpful. Um, moving on then to item number two, which is to um, approve the proposed general fund and trust fund budgets for fiscal year 2022 to 23 and provide direction to staff. Inga, would you like to provide an overview? Sure. Well, this is really the reason why we're having a special meeting today, as opposed to looking at this um, item and our usual uh, meeting time of uh, March 24th, because the department heads are expected to submit their budget proposals to the city um, by end of day tomorrow. And so because you are an administrative board, I want to run the proposal um, by you and um, have it be a proposal that the board supports before it's submitted. And then just to remind you of the steps, once, once you approve numbers and then it's submitted, that doesn't mean it's going to be funded. So what happens is of course, all the different department heads put in their request and then the city looks at the overall picture and the projections for revenue overall, other big ticket items they know are coming down the road, like maybe a, a new huge vehicle of some kind um, street sweeper or something, I don't know. But anyway, everything has to get sort of balanced out and then they look and see, you know, do we have enough funding to um, give all these different departments what they're asking for? And then it's quite, oh, and then I will be called in uh, to what's called a budget hearing with the city manager and the finance uh, director. And I'll be asked to justify, you know, what it is we've asked for and, um, be given possibly some scenarios of, you know, would this be a higher priority or that a higher priority? And um, if it's a significant change, then um, I would bring it back to the board. If it's a minor correction or adjustment, then uh, maybe I wouldn't need to bring it back to the board. So that's one thing that we'll kind of talk about. And um, at the end of this meeting, I'll have some direction so I'll know um, based on, on what happens at the budget hearing. Um, so let me just walk you through what the request is. And um, so in the fiscal implications on packet page seven, up towards the middle of the page, um, overall we're requesting 2,203,141 for the general fund. And um, 
$239,993 in the trust fund, of which 103885 in expenses would come from the unrestricted portion. That's, you know, people make uh, just general gifts to the library, and then we would be spending that money. The remainder is money that was given to the library for that specific purpose. So then we use it for a specific purpose. Um, so I wanted to set the tone a little bit uh, for this budget year. So um, pre-pandemic, we were doing two-year budgets because uh, the city felt pretty confident that they could look out, you know, look forward and sort of get a good sense of what's going to be happening with the economy and with the city's um, expenses and so forth. Um, because of the pandemic, and because of the huge, huge losses um, that the city sustained because of um, COVID, uh, the city has shortened its window. And so we're just looking a year out. And we just had the mid-year budget uh, meeting, budget adjustment meeting with the city council. And it looked pretty rosy. We actually, there was a more money left over at the end of last fiscal year than anticipated. The TOT is coming in stronger than anticipated. Sales tax is looking good. So um, there was actually council decision to set some monies aside for special things like the rainy day fund, restoring some money there, putting aside money for the conference center, repairs and or maintenance, and also for the um, sports center, et cetera. So that all looked pretty good. But we were reminded in the slides that the finance director shared with us at that um, council meeting is that if you look forward, we are still projecting that there are gonna be shortfalls. And that was anticipated before the pandemic. And a lot of that has to do with the unfunded uh, liability for pension funds, if I said that right. So um, we are anticipating shortfall. And so we also don't know what's gonna happen with the pandemic. And so the um, instruction to department heads and then what I've presented to you is a very conservative budget. Um, so that said, first we look at revenue and for revenue for the general fund, I was very conservative and uh, we already talked a little bit about this idea that the amount that we're taking in for library fines has just continued to decrease and increase over years. And now um, in our immediate area, we're the only public library that charges fines. So Carmel doesn't charge anymore. Pacific Grove hasn't reinstated their fines. The county recently declared that they're not charging fines and Salinas is not charging fines for children. Not sure about adults, but anyway, so in our immediate area, um, the public libraries aren't charging fines and people know, well, I can just go to Carmel if, if they're worried about something like that, um, or they can go to Pacific Grove and just choose not to use Monterey Public if need be. And also it's been a national movement to remove fines and um, it's been tied to equity issues and especially children who have much less control of their finances. You know, the concern is that children get locked out of their accounts because fines have accrued, which wasn't in their control to return things on time and so forth. And then children are the ones who need to be able to feel welcome and be able to use libraries and, and be able to you know, continue to learn and sort of develop that muscle of lifelong learning. So anyway, so it is an issue that we're gonna to wanna to look at, but uh, in short, we're just not gonna be taking in much in fines and that's the major form of revenue that we generate right now for the general fund. So um, we do charge $5 a month for uh, people who live outside of California if they want a library card. And so far this year, we've received three people who've taken us up on that offer. So we've made a whole $15. So I estimated that we might make as much as 50 in the coming year. Um, and then Pacific Grove, we used to share a lot of expenses together. Right now, the one thing we share is something called Discover and Go, which is um, an account that we have where people can use our library card to make reservations to go places like the Exploratorium, you know, and other museums that are up in the Bay Area. But of course, last year, 
most of those facilities were closed, so it wasn't a very popular service, but now it's sort of starting back up again. So Pacific Grove reimburses us for their portion of the agreement, which is $185, so it's not a big ticket item either. Um, so then where we are uh, requesting an increase in expenses is in staffing. And um, that's the major area. So, and why is that? Well, as we know, we um, went from a staff of over 20 FTE, full-time equivalents, to um, uh, after the pandemic began and then there were huge layoffs, there were four of us remaining and some part-time hours. And then um, this year we've been building back with the model that you adopted of um, increasing gradually to um, sort of a core set of staff positions that staff our core services. And we did an exercise last year where we looked at our core services. And so the positions that we're asking for are positions that support our core services and, and it includes acquisitions, making that position full-time, because we know, and as Bob, um, Trustee Petty just uh, mentioned a while ago, the um, every survey that we do of our community, uh, community members say, you know, they come to the library for the collections and, you know, they see the collections as a priority. And so acquisitions is the position that does all the ordering and tracking of orders and so forth. And so that's a key position for us to keep up with our uh, collections. And then um, asking also to restore the bookmobile position to full time from regular part time. And we won't even talk about when uh, Trustee Felga worked for the library, how many positions there were, including librarians who worked on the bookmobile. So we've really cut back on that service, cut back on um, that staffing. And we thought that we had gone as far as we could go. Of course, having no service at all, which was last year, was as far as we could go. But then um, this year we have very minimal staff and we know that we're not meeting the need that's out there. And so we want to restore it a full time position. Then also a children's librarian. And we have um, part time funds for children's librarians right now. And I do want to say that the, the folks who are working hourly um, doing that work are wonderful, but it doesn't give you the same service as a librarian who's assigned to that, who gets to know the community, who makes the big decisions about sort of like looking forward, how are we gonna plan the year, can go to the schools and work with the teachers, develop relationships with the parents. Um, and so it's, we just don't have the same caliber of children's services that um, we think our community needs and deserves. And then the same thing, uh, having a teen librarian. And because we are within walking distance of Colton Hall and the high school, we have, this is the hardest group for libraries to reach is teens. Traditionally, teens, you know, parents aren't bringing them here and uh, they don't have their own transportation. So typically they, they aren't here if your library isn't located so close to the school. So we have this great opportunity to continue a relationship, help uh, kids as they're getting ready for college and so forth, helping them on that kind of bridge between being little to being more responsible and adults and so forth. And without a teen librarian, it's really hard to provide any kind of programming. So those are the positions that we're requesting. Um, I've also put in a small amount for um, some part-time so that we don't uh, totally eliminate our part-time librarian hours and um, added some more part-time um, library assistant type hours because of course, once you have staff, then staff need to take vacations, they're out sick, they go to a, a meeting offsite, et cetera. So we need some on-call hours. Um, for supplies and services, um, we were asked not to request more than a 3% increase. And um, they went through, and because we're doing this uh, process of having a zero-based budget, they looked at every single line that we had and asked, you know, what is in here that we still need? Is there anything that we could take out? 
and we identified a number of things that were had been budgeted in the past that we didn't need to budget. So there's software for the book jobber that we were using, but this year we've changed. So we don't need to pay that next year, um, change the system that we use. There was a line for RFID funds, which we've spent. So we don't need to repopulate that line with the same amount of money this coming year because we've purchased all of that great equipment. And then we have some money set aside in the trust fund for any remaining equipment that we would like to get that's RFID related. Um, we have some outdated telephone renewal software, which there's a small number of people that still use the service, but um, it's it will require a whole new server and so forth if we wanna maintain it. So it's just one of those things where it's not, not worth it to continue that telephone renewal service. Um, the self-check lease, so we're leasing our self-checks, um, but that lease will end in November, and so we don't need to budget that whole year of lease payments. And um, we've cut back on our technical services supply line because we are ordering books that come to us already cataloged and processed with their stickers and barcodes and um, covers and so forth, so we don't need to buy as much of that stuff in the coming year. And then um, for years, we've been on this program for emergency radios, which was just shared across all the departments. It was just built into your budget. You couldn't get rid of it. We didn't have any radios. They, <laughs> the library didn't have any radios, but it was just charged to all the departments. But I convinced the fire chief that you know, he's like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And you don't have any radios, so we shouldn't be charging you anymore. So we took that out of the budget as well. Um, and then we can repurpose those funds. Um, the most important one, I think, is uh, repurposing some of those cuts to restoring more of the um, acquisitions budget. So right now we're at 50% in the general fund of what we used to be in the general fund. So I'm recommending that we increase it. So now we'll just be two thirds of what we used to have. So we're just taking baby steps to get back to at least where we were pre-pandemic and the argument for that would be because the public prioritizes our collections. And even when we get back to $128,000 that we used to have in the general fund for materials purchases, even that number, um, it had been static for almost 10 years. So with the cost of you know, book publishing going up and up, we were slowly um, you know, falling behind anyway. So there's, but we're taking baby steps, I recommend um, adding a bit more so that we're just at two thirds of what we were before. Um, and then uh, we've been concerned and the board has been concerned about staff development, you know, um, staff being able to keep up on what's happening in the world of library technology and um, youth programming. And that's how you develop partnerships with other libraries, that's how you learn you know, you can meet all different vendors, you know, by going to meetings and going to trainings and so forth, um, conferences. So it built a little bit of money back in, not, not nearly what we had before, um, but and also restored the um, stipends, the trustee stipends, and then um, set aside some money for a staff day. We didn't budget that this year but it's a good idea. And I think especially with a new director to have a day that we close to the public where staff can get together and, and learn together and celebrate their successes and that sort of thing. Um, and then some money set aside for a volunteer appreciation event. So that's been a very popular, popular um, activity in the past. And now we rely so heavily on our volunteers because they're doing all the shelving, most of the shelving, 99.9% .9 of the shelving and retrieval is being done by volunteers at this point. So that's sort of the, uh, the big part, big um, general fund revenue and then expenditures. Um, they're interdepartment transfers. And I would like to say interdepartmental, but it's interdepartment. And those are charges that we have very little control over. So those are the, we pay a portion of the information services department's um, costs and um, all of the different departments 
pay a percentage of those costs. So that includes the staff and so forth in the um, information services department. Then we also pay an amount per device as well, but that's just a minuscule amount of sort of the overall, we pay for a portion of the internet for the whole city, we pay a portion of that bill. So those are the kinds of things that we have little control over and typically in a budget, um, the board gives me the latitude just to put those numbers in, the updated numbers once we receive them. Another um, example of those interdepartment transfers is the bookmobile costs. So we don't know uh, what the new ongoing costs for a new bookmobile will be, other than we know it'll be a lot less than our current vehicle. And um, when Kim and I attended webinars with bookmobile experts and they talked about different models of bookmobiles, they said that um, sprinter vans are a lot less expensive to maintain than what we have, which is a, a cutaway, a Ford truck cutaway type bookmobile. Um, but since we are not receiving a bookmobile until June of next year, most of the budget year, it's going to be the old bookmobile. So I didn't update those numbers. Um, so should we, should I keep going? And am I giving too much detail? Could I, should I move past? I think uh, my, my sense of that would be in things that are already covered in the report, maybe you are giving a little too much detail. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, so moving on to the trust fund, basically, with the trust fund, we're, we always try to be conservative in how much revenue we're going to take in because we don't know. We don't know how much uh, we might raise in Monterey County gives next uh, year. And of course, we have to compete to even be allowed to be part of Monterey County gives. So worst case scenario, we wouldn't be uh, selected, but I don't, I don't anticipate that. So, so we don't want to count our... Uh, chickens before they're hatched. So um, we're conservative in the amount of money that we think we might raise next year. And then we hope to be pleasantly surprised as a bequest comes in or as a new grant comes in, et cetera. And then because of the changes in staffing, we also anticipate that we might raise less. I know my first year as library director here, the numbers were lower because I was trying to keep get up to speed on everything and I didn't have as much focus on fundraising. Then um, trust fund expenditures are on the list of uh, that's provided to you in the chart. And basically we have projects that we're working on, um, like uh, spending the Monterey County gives money that we received this year, spending the bookmobile monies that we received this year and um, so forth. So I think I, I'll wrap it up and uh, take questions. Okay, thank you very much for that overview, uh, Inga. Uh, trustee, questions for Inga about the proposed budget? Marsha. Oh, silent. Uh, you, you're muted, Marsha. Um, I, I just have a question on the, on, the, on the actual proposal itself. On page nine, where it says increasing library expenses, you know that section, back at page nine, the second paragraph. You see, are you with me? Where it says library use statistics, it says it could be argued that our visitation levels do indicate a demand for additional staff. I think maybe you do not. Do not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then there then. was yeah. There was one other piece. Oh yeah, on packet page eight. This is just right before the thing that says revenue. Uh, the paragraph is starts a slight change in staffing. We've got from 10 hours to 20 hours per week per week. So I think that get moved around a little bit. Um, so th th those were those are just those little questions. Um, Wait, but so I'm not getting that one. So increasing administrative mine support. says increase administrative support from 10 hours to 20 hours per week per week. Oh, sorry. Yes. I think you just repeated the words. <laughs> yeah, I think. Stuttering. 
to yeah. say from 10 hours per week to 20 hours per week or something like that. that yes, yeah. thank you. And then I just had one little question, the, the one about the software service, that's not, that's only eliminating that specific software service, right? That's not giving up any other software support. Or no, right. We were working with a, a, a book selling company, um, very widely used by libraries called Baker and Taylor. Uh -huh. And they charged us $2,000 a year for software that those of us who ordered books had or selected books had to put on our computers. And then we created these shopping carts that then we sent to our acquisition staff person. And she was able to use those shopping carts to purchase the materials, sort of like Amazon has shopping carts. Yeah. So um, we were using them almost exclusively and now we're not using them anymore. We're using an, another vendor that's processing our materials for us and they don't charge a similar charge for that same kind of software. I see. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other uh, trustee questions before we go to public comment? Bob. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, a general comment. I am very, very pleased with this overall proposal. And I think it uh, hits all the uh, right things and the right, and it emphasizes the right. Um, aspects of the library that we want to get more support for. And um, so the, the small handful of questions I have, not all of which am I going to mention now, are simply just saying, what does this mean? What does that mean? Not questioning the uh, worthwhileness, if that's a word. Um, so for example, um, in the chart on packet page 13, um, one number difference from <clears throat> current to next fiscal year that I noticed is the uh, drop from 52,000 to 28,000 in contract services. Just tell me what contract services mean. So the contract services were things like the software um, ah. and RFID. You know, we had put a bunch of money in there to purchase the RFID equipment, but now it's been purchased. So it's stuff we don't need rather than stuff we're eliminating. I mean, be, we're not we're cutting it out. It just doesn't need it anymore. Okay. Yeah. And, either because uh, we are not budgeting for it again. Yeah. Or because we've already because we got decided it. Yeah. to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. And the same question for a couple lines above that operating supplies. Um, I'm sorry, not operating supplies. Uh, that that is increased. Um, Oh, I guess I, I I wasn't questioning the increase from eleven to thirteen thousand, but I'm not sure what operating supplies are. Is that pencils and staplers and erasers and stuff <laughs> like that, or what are operating supplies? I'm just curious what it means. So, which line are you looking at? I see office supplies. What do you uh, go down to two oh five? Oh right. So operating supplies. My goodness. Well, uh, it depends on the different divisions of the library, but for instance in um we'll go back to acquisitions for instance there are some materials that we can't purchase through a vendor that sends it to us already uh processed so uh, we need to have some book covers and barcodes and stuff but just a smaller quantity um and then in uh, uh some of the things that our admin um staff member is responsible for uh, some of it comes out of office supplies and some of it comes out of operating supplies, but things like paper for the photocopiers and toner and those kinds of things. And then there is a small amount of staples and paper clips and post-its and, and that kind of stuff. Too. Now that same line item on the following page where we're looking at the trust fund budget is significantly reduced from current fiscal year to next fiscal year. And that's because as we get um, monies donated to us, say we have, uh, we go to the friends and we say, uh, please fund summer reading for us, the summer reading program. Uh, we need $5,000 in supplies for children's programs. Then that money gets, um, uh, there's a recommendation to allocate that money that's made by the trustees. And then it goes to city council and city council approves it. 
since we don't know what those amounts are going to be, it ebbs and flows in the budget what those amounts are. Okay, so that's why when I look at that chart, it it goes from thirty two thousand all the way down to twelve thousand uh, in the trust fund chart for uh, operating supplies. It's thirty two five down to twelve nine. Mm -hmm. That just seemed like a big jump downward for some reason, and I didn't understand exactly what the line item meant. Right, so, and the other part that this doesn't include is what we don't spend by the end of the year of that budgeted 32,000, we'll then be asking to have rolled over or oh. reappropriated and um, so then that number will go up in the 12,000 will go up. I got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. And uh, again, that clarifies the things I didn't know what they meant. And overall, I think this is a excellent budget proposal for us to submit. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Other trustee questions? I'd like to ask a question. Harish, go ahead. Uh, on page 10, under the proposed trust fund budget, you say, we estimate raising 80,000. And then when I look at the bottom of uh, page 12, we're gonna be spending 70,000 for fund development. That couldn't be right, could it? That we're gonna invest 70,000 to raise 80,000? Uh, so it's, again, it's a conservative number. So we don't know how much we'll be raising. And so we always estimate a conservative number and then are, are thrilled to see what we do raise. So yeah, that is, act, I mean, those are the numbers that I was projecting. Um, for instance, the friends, if they fund two different wish lists for us at 25,000 each, that's 50,000. And conservatively, if we only raise 30,000 this coming year, through MC Gives, that will reach the $80,000. But um, this year through MC Gives, we raised $66,000. And the friends, I haven't totaled it up lately, um, but uh, and you'll be seeing that in a future report, um, they've given well over 50,000. So it's, uh, it's possible that you know, the amount raised will be more like 120,000 or something like that. Okay, any other questions before we go to public input? Or actually, I have a couple, but any of the other trustees before I ask my questions? Um, I do have two questions, uh, Inga, on the, the charts at the end, uh, starting with the uh, one on packet page 13. The, the which is the proposed general fund budget and then showing some history uh the first column that says it, it indicates it's fy 21 pre-cuts um but i believe sh shouldn't that be fy 1920 instead of it FY should. sorry 1921? yes 1920 so just just for the record that on page 13 <laughs> that first column should be fy 20 pre -COVID. Pre yeah. instead of uh fy 21 and then similarly on packet page 12 in the FY21 column under public services, I believe there's a position missing uh, from that FY21 public services staffing summary. Did yeah, you, right. So did, I should have pointed have that a, out. A librarian there that should be right. reflected in that so that we actually had 2.5 uh, FTEs in public services instead of the 1.75. We'd have the the three three halftime positions plus the one um, full time librarian, which was the position that uh, Kim was uh, holding in during that period. Is that correct? That's correct. So we had overall we had four full time staff members who were retained after the layoffs, and then in addition to that, we were able to get some part time funding. So yeah, I missed that we uh, in that column that you pointed out we should have one librarian. 
Yeah, so again, just for the record, so the, the total for public services, if you add in that 1.0 programming library and the total for public services should actually be 2.5 instead of 1.75. And the general fund grand total should be 8.25 instead of 7.5. So I just point that out for the record because um, this sort of uh, document is sometimes used in, uh, in going back and looking at things. Um, if nothing else, uh, Francesca, Jim, could you? Jim, just a clarification on that. Does that change the dollar figure? No, the, oh, no, so the dollar figure won't change because there's no dollar figure for. Right, this was just a summary of positions. Okay. And Jim, you're just adding in 0.75 to that, not 1.0? Yeah, it it is 1.0. And then if you add that to the three halftime positions, that's a total of 2.5. I think the 1.75 was a, Oh, I see. Okay. An error. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, I was adding one to 1.75 and trying to figure out where yeah. you were going. Okay. The 1.75 was actually an error itself. So there were yeah. two, yeah, yeah, two yeah, errors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, if uh, if nothing else on that, I'm sorry if I created confusion. I was just trying to correct the record. Um, uh, Francesca, could you see if there's any public input on item number two? Yes. To make a public comment, raise your Zoom hand, or if you are connected by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand. Chair Thompson, there are no public comments. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, board comment on the overall budget proposal. Bob, I know indicated general satisfaction with it, but go ahead, Bob, if you wanted to add to that. Well, uh, we, you know, after a motion is made and seconded, then you can always discuss it some more. So uh, I would like to move that with the cor corrections that have been uh, uh, delineated in our discussion, uh, that we, uh, I move to approve the budget proposal that has been submitted with those additional corrections that we have identified. I'll be happy to second that. Bob made the motion and Jennifer seconded it. And I believe Marcia had uh, uh, her hand up earlier for discussion, is that right? Well, I also wanted to say, I think it really reflects the discussions that we've been having over the, over the uh, periods, of, periods of time uh, in, in the board about what we need. It also reflects the results of the survey. So um, I think it's a, it's a great step forward. Um, I'm trying to reconcile it with the planning document that the ultimate planning document that we we read. I think it's also concordant with that that we had planned to add these positions. Um, I don't know whether the city will you know will um, approve them in this time frame, but I, I think it was that too. Maybe you want to say something about that. Amy? Sure. So. Um, we had in the um, plan from last year, we had said that we would have a um, have the library assistant go from uh, part time to full time, which is what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. And we would restore a children's librarian position. And then if funding permitted, then we would make the bookmobile position full time and make the teen librarian or we in state a teen librarian full time. So it's it's consistent with that. Thank you. Yeah. Other just other discussion on the motion. I, I uh, am going to support the motion and um, agree, echo Bob's comments that I think this is a good approach. I think it's um, reasonable under the budget the, th the budget threats that the city city still has so I don't think it's going overboard at all, but I think it's just making is making some significant um, progress towards where we would like to end up. Um, I would hope that maybe in the neck in the mid year budget of next year that we could perhaps take some further steps because I, I, you know, for example, if you look at the overall staffing. This is actually an inc a proposed increase of 1.7 full time equivalent positions which I think is, you know, even though some of them are more expensive than the part-time positions that they might replace, you know, is still a fairly reasonable um, increment step. Uh, and it would still leave us at about 60%, 68% of the staffing we had pre-pandemic. So it's still quite a bit less. And I would hope that there might be an opportunity, you know, in the mid-year budget of the following year 
to make some further steps. So I would hope that this would not be the maximum for the entire year in terms of a proposal, but our, our, uh, our proposal for the, the start of the fiscal year with perhaps an opportunity to fine tune it the following January. Um, and I realize that's yet to be to be uh, determined, but anyway, I just wanted to offer those comments to um, uh, leave the door open, uh, uh, at least a, a crack to doing a little bit more next fiscal year if the revenues come in um, well. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? I just uh, that brings me to a to a question: Does it make sense to to at least put down as a second alternative those? Um, the hopes for January, and then at least get them out on the table. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you're allowed, if you could do that to put a scenario that says, you know, this is what we would like to see by the end of the fiscal year, and and then and then table it. Or, or, or is there really an opportunity in January or so to ask for more? In other words, um, if you don't ask for it, you don't get it. And yeah, I, I don't think that you know this is still under underfunded. Hey, I'll, I'll I'd be interested in Inga's response to that, but my sense of it is that um, it might be a bit presumptuous to suggest that at this point. I think more just that we would like, if, if the revenues come in fairly fairly well this coming year, that we would like an opportunity to make a pitch for something later uh, to be effective in January. But I, I personally wouldn't recommend we try to um articulate that because we don't really know too much about what the finances will be but bob go ahead i think we could refer to it as uh, the the board sees this as a stepping stone toward restoration of uh fuller library services yeah and I, you know that would just let them know we're looking ahead right okay if no other uh discussion on the motion uh, francesca would you call the roll please Yes, Felgu. Yes. Joshi. Yes. Mello. Yes. Petty. Yes. And Thompson. Yes. Um, Inga, the um, uh, at our previous board meeting, uh, we had some discussion about the prioritization of these positions. And I wanted to see if as a subsequent motion, it would be useful for the board to attempt to grapple with our priorities among the four and get your recommendations about that, or if you think that's unnecessary at this point. I think that's helpful because I do know from a meeting that I had with um, the city manager and the assistant city manager, uh, they had looked at the board packet and they said, it seems to be reasonable what you're asking for. Um, however, there are lots of reasonable requests from other departments and we're not going to be able to fund all of it. So it would be helpful to be able to make the case um, that, you know, these are our priorities. And, and, and what we're really talking about is, is the, the four uh, positions that we're basically uh, re requesting be made full time. Mm -hmm. So maybe a good place to start, Inga, would be if you could um, articulate again what your recommended priority would be among those four. Great. I think I, I'm going to have to say a children's librarian would be the top priority. I just think that's a huge hole in our service. And um, worst case scenario, the children's librarian who focuses on young folks does some teen programs as well. So. Children's librarian would be first. Um, acquisitions, making that position full time, would be second. Bookmobile, third. And then teen librarian, fourth. Okay, thank you. Um, trustee, questions or uh, discussion on um, Inga's suggestion there or her, her prioritization of those four positions? Where's the acquisitions? Uh position are you looking on packet page 12 yeah uh, she refers to it there as library assistant two slash requisitions oh requisitions another, that, yeah that's what she means when she says acquisitions <laughs> i was wondering so, that was another thing i didn't know what the difference between acquisitions and requisitions was but that's the one you're talking about right so i yeah, should well, have I, changed changed how i was referring to it i had thought that that position would be ordering more than just library materials. And that's sort of 
yet to be determined. First, we've got to get the ordering of library materials straightened yeah. up, and then it might take on other ordering as well. Well, I apologize for not remembering what you just said in terms of ordering the four positions, but I, I think the um, uh, teen slash children's librarian and the uh, requisitions acquisitions should be the top two. So I had said children is first, acquisitions is second, bookmobile is third, and teen is fourth in the way I've been seeing the priorities. Because we're actually proposing separate positions for children's yeah. librarian and teen librarian. Right. And I, I should say, if we're able to get a teen librarian, so the great thing about teen librarians is that they can do adult programs and oh. they can do children's programs oh. and they can do teen programs. So it's not as if any of our positions are going to be locked in, but I think somebody who can focus on those, the littlest audience is a, a basic starting point. That well, it sounds possible. like what you just said is that it should be uh, acquisitions and then teen because the teen can do children and adults as well. It's like a multi-purpose person. In, I, a pinch, in a pinch they could, but their uh -huh. focus is on teens. So I think we really need somebody who understands that early de developmental okay. things for children and um, can work more closely or work with the schools, and then eventually we'll get the teen position, and hopefully it'll be at you know July one. And it's number four on the list the way you presented it. Correct. So yeah. can so can, oh, sure. can the um, children's librarian work with teens as well? That would be the the plan that they could do. They could do older older folks, but their focus. Um, and their specialty would be younger. Okay. Other board uh, questions or comments on the prioritization that Inga has recommended? What I if somebody says, what does the bookmobile person do when they're not driving the bookmobile around town? That is an excellent question. So one of the, if I was asked now, what's the next step and holes to fill? Um, we really need more support for circulation staff but um traditionally the way what we've done with our bookmobile driver when they're not driving the bookmobile is they staff the circulation desk so that helps because ideally the person's a spanish language speaker so we have that person in the building um who, and then also by working the front desk that position um stays connected with the other staff members, is able to take what they're learning out onto the bookmobile or share what the bookmobile is doing with the staff back in the library. Because a lot of the bookmobile process is circulation. It's just circulation off of a vehicle. So it really helps them to do it at the main desk as well. So it's more of a multi-purpose position than it sounds like when you just say bookmobile driver. And right. It's a whole now, lot more than that. If we had a bookmobile librarian, <laughs> so you know, one of the things we do that's so important is we bring programming out to these stops. And in a place like Montecito Park, where um, that's the you know um, uh, economically challenged folks live there, they don't have a community center, um, and so the programs that we offer there are so deeply appreciated by the people that live there and with a, a bookmobile librarian would sort of look at the whole year plan mm -hmm. performers plan you know programs plan series and all that kind of stuff um but we don't have that capacity at this point but we can plan you now a summer reading kickoff and uh, a Dia de los Niños program and um, some other things like that. Mm -hmm. So, other comments or questions about Inga's proposed prioritization of the four positions? If not, anybody care to make a motion? So move. Second. So, just to clarify, the motion is to um, um, approve the prioritization that Inga yes. has authorized or has yeah. recommended, which is children's librarian first, the library assistant two for 
requisitions and acquisitions second, the full-time bookmobile um, library assistant two, third, and the teen librarian fourth. Yes. Any dis further discussion on the motion? I, I, I believe there was a second, correct? I believe. Yeah, yeah Marcia did. Yeah, Marcia seconded. Yes, very good. Any further discussion on the motion? Francesca, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Felga. Yes. Joshi. Yes. Moreau. Yes. Petty. Yes. Thompson. Yes, motion carries unanimously. Um, then I think the only other thing I'm aware of on this item was that um, I think Inga wanted to um, have a little better sense of um, when the board might need to get back together to provide further direction as it goes through the budget process. And if I recall correctly, I think last year we gave the the board uh, gave a certain amount of um, um, authority, if you will, to the chair and vice chair to use their discretion about whether some change would be, you know, was within kind of the spirit of the board's direction or whether we thought it really should go back and even, even if necessary, call a special board meeting uh, to provide further direction if it was particularly significant. So I wanted to see if the trustee, please feel free to add to that, but I wanted to kind of get a sense as to whether at least by consensus, we might uh, see if the board's comfortable with that general direction. Can you add to that, Inga, in terms of what you're looking for, or what you think would be helpful? Uh, I think that would be helpful. So there will be some things like the finance department will come back with some adjusted figures for the staff positions. So they gave us a, an initial list to work on, but um, then I'll need to adjust the benefits and adjust the, the salary and that sort of thing. And since that's the sort of thing that I would like the latitude to make those corrections or adjustments without needing to take the whole thing back to the board. And I think if I um, update the uh, chair and vice chair on those kinds of changes, then you can determine if it if something needs to come back to the board or not. Are the trustees comfortable with that uh, suggestion? That's fine with me, except that I would ask that there be some kind of that there be an item on our April meeting because our regular board meeting in April, uh, because that would be after if I'm looking at the dates list here, it would be after the city manager and finance department finalize the proposed budgets, but before the city council study session. And if that could just be one of our uh, agenda items for the April meeting, we would have the opportunity to you know, make some observations or comments uh, there without scheduling a whole special separate meeting. Great. And Go ahead, Inga. If, if um, once all of the information is compiled and the city manager's recommendation to the council does not include a significant amount of what we've requested, and I, we've had our budget hearing and there's, you know, still a big discrepancy there's always the opportunity at any point for the board to speak directly to the council about mm -hmm. concerns yeah. so i think that having an update before a study session would be a good idea mm -hmm. sure. well if we if we plan on scheduling that for our agenda in april then i'm very comfortable leaving the uh you know, back and forth on not super big, significant changes to our um, board officers. Very good. I don't think we probably need a motion on that. <clears throat> um, is there any further discussion on this uh, on this budget item? If not, thank you very much, uh, board, for uh, getting through a fairly complicated uh, budget situation uh, so well. Uh, next item on our agenda is informational reports and staff comments. We don't have any formal reports, but Inga, did you have any verbal uh, staff comments or any of the other staff for that matter? Um, I can just quickly mention, and I believe I did send this out as an email, that mm -hmm. we are we do have a recruitment now open for mm -hmm. the bookmobile position. It's 30 hours a week, and um, we hope we get somebody into that position soon and so 
steer any prospects our way. <laughs> so, can I? Marsha. I just had a question on that. So, you're recruiting for a 30 hour a week position, but you're requesting a 40 hour a week position. And so, if that gets approved, for next year, does the thir- it, it, the recruitment starts all over again? Is that the way it works, or does the thirty-hour person get ten more hours? How, how does how does that work? That's a good question. So, in the past, the way that's worked is the incumbent has um, been moved into the adjusted position. I, I think that I th- that's the history I would re- recall from when I worked for the city as well. So it's uh, so when you recruit for it, do you tell people that perhaps be, because I think it would make a difference. There are some people who wouldn't take a thirty-hour position, mm-hmm. might take it knowing that it would, might become a forty-hour position. So uh, what we informally say in our uh, written advertising is um, it's a thirty-hour week position with the potential, oh, potential of coming yeah. full time. Yeah. Uh, down the road at some future date. And then we wouldn't um, presume to uh, emphasize that with a candidate, um, you know, oh, don't worry, it'll be full time before you know it, because we don't know that. We don't know what the city council will adopt. On the other hand, you know, as we evaluate uh, applicants, we will mention it as part of the interview, you know, if this position were to become full time, would you still be interested in it? So. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Very good. Any other informational reports, Inga? No, not at this time. Okay, then uh, trustee comments. Uh, trustee Petty. Um, <clears throat> number one, uh, on packet page eight, if you want to correct a typo that I actually found, um, <laughs> in the last paragraph under that's entitled revenue, on packet page eight, revenue, the yes. very second line, it says, to a more conservative figure. <laughs> and <clears throat> my, and then uh, last thing, I, I want to ask, what we, we were talking about library fines, and PG library doesn't have fines, but Monterey library does. So I'm sitting here trying to put my, not put myself asleep, thinking about what if I borrow a book with my Monterey library card that belongs to the PG library and I return it late, do I have to pay a fine? Or what if I'm a PG library card holder and I borrow a, li- a Monterey library book and I return it late, am I exempt from the fine because my card says PG on it? All of that sounds like too much confusion to continue. Um, but I, I was just playing around with the concept of, because sharing the catalog and the collection between the two libraries is, you know, essential. I mean, we need to do that. Right. But if I borrow one of their books and they don't levy fines, or they borrow one of ours and we do, it seems like there could be. And everything we've said all day long here is to avoid confusion amongst our patrons, whether it's what time we open or when yeah. our services are available, and um, we ought to do something to make that clear and. For the few fines that we do collect, it was just a fun thing that was rattling around in my brain. So the way it works is that the um, the policy of the lender is enforced. So if um, somebody brings a book that they borrowed from Pacific Grove, that came from Pacific Grove, back and it's late at our library, we're not going to charge them anything because the library that they borrowed it from doesn't charge fines. Even if I use my Monterey library card to borrow it. Right, but unfortunately, so it's the, the rule goes with the lending material. And this is like established from back when interlibrary loan used to be a service. Yeah, yeah. It was always yeah, yeah. dependent on the lending library, you know, what the loan period would be. Hmm. Any other comments, Bob? Oh, no, no. That- that okay. actually explains another question I've always had is why if I borrow certain materials, then they belong to PG, I don't get to keep them as long as if they belong to Monterey, so. <laughs> yep. Very good. Uh, Trustee Joshi. Well, I'm curious about the extra hours. That'll incur 
more expenses and facility costs, the heating, air conditioning, all that. Is that significant or is that just a minor drop in the bucket? Well, when we were closed, there was not a significant reduction in those um, costs. And so I think a lot of those costs are just planned out um, over the year without it being really tied to a meter that's uh, detecting the actual kilowatts used and so forth. Okay. Thanks. Okay, very good. But that does raise an important point, which is uh, we don't know what the increase is going to be for our utility bills. And I, I had anticipated a decrease for the year that we were closed, which didn't surface. And so what I did was I looked at the past five years and took an average, and that's how I estimated mm -hmm. for this coming year. But it could be, it could be off. Very good. Anything else, Trustee Joshi? No, thanks. That's that's it. Good. Trustee Mora. No comments. Okay. Vice Chair Felgeth. Just that I'm glad we're going through this process and I'm going to hold optimistic thoughts that it's going to get approved and we're going to get the staffing and materials we need uh, so we can better serve our community. Thanks. Very Thank good. You. Very good. Um, I just had uh, two quick comments. One, as I mentioned before, I just wanted to particularly thank um, Trustee Thalgeth and, uh, and uh, Petty for their work on the uh, survey committee. Uh, sometimes we forget how much work uh, some of us are doing on, on various committees, and I just wanted to publicly, again, acknowledge the work that you've done on that. We very much appreciate it. And the second one is, um, uh, just wanted to mentioned for anyone that may not have noticed it yet or heard about it yet that the uh, city is lighting up Colton Hall at night with the colors of the Ukrainian flag and I think that's very appropriate and I just wanted to express our or at least my personal solidarity with uh, Ukraine in the very difficult time they're going through and I hope that ends well if there is a possible way of doing that. Um, so with that, I think we're uh, ready to adjourn the meeting to our March 24, 2022 regular meeting of the uh, Board of Library Trustees. Thank you all very much and have a good afternoon.